So we are starting with second part, it's session 19b of the course on mathematical signal methods of signal processing. And I would like to start with the picture, which is on the one hand relating to the Shannon sampling theorem as I have just described now in part A. Uh, and it will be also a basic idea for the proof of the first version of the Gabor expansion theorem. Okay, so what are we doing? Uh, we are uh, looking at a function, which is real and complex part of a smooth, well-localized function. And we are having a periodic version. And if the support is limited, then for a sufficiently large support of the periodic function can be used to recover the original one. We just have to multiply with the function which is reproducing the first part. And because we want to have good locality, we make this in a smooth way. Okay, so this idea should you should keep in mind uh, while I'm giving you a proof or an explanation of the of the um, uh, of the of Gabor expansions. So again, another thing is. We have already seen that a function in a zero, and I will do everything first in the zero setting. A function in a zero is a function which by localizing it, you will have pieces. And these pieces are also in the Fourier algebra. So they're also continuous. And so I just took uh, one of these functions. I was regularizing, localizing it with some bupu, and you have such functions. And the point is that this decomposition, you start from left to going to the middle, to the right, that this is absolutely convergent in the Fourier, series, Fourier algebra. So this is a very concrete decomposition into pieces. And so essentially the idea will be, now we will work, start with these pieces, but what are we going to do when we talk about Garber analysis and you see MATLAB is, uh, no, LATIC is choosing, um, putting everything a little bit in a mixed mode. So we are going to do this first version of the of the, uh, of the Gabor exp expression. So uh, we are looking at the situation that somebody, that we start with something like this trapezoidal function, but it should be a smooth trapezoidal function. Uh, so it is a function which like the black one in the in the first image, which has compact support in the free transform in L1. So it would be enough to take a real trapezoidal function uh, which has linear side lobes, or you're taking a smoothed version of, of such a thing. Then the claim is then you can obtain or expand every function in a zero as a linear combination or a double series of time frequency shifted elements of this particular tau, if only A is small enough and B is small enough. So the game will be the following. You're telling me here I have my trapezoidal function and then I do some computation in the background and say, well, okay, if you choose A less than one over 10 and B less than one over 20, then you're fine. That means you can choose your A and B as long as it's small enough. And actually both have to be small, not only the product. And then you can ask me to uh, produce or describe an expansion method that allows to describe uh, a series expansion of F. And the point is, is absolutely convergent sum in a zero. So that's always the most decent, most nice expansion where the coefficients have to be, or luckily can be chosen in a linear way. So you're having not only the fact that individual functions f can be written in such a way with L1 coefficients. No, I'm, I'm telling you I can fabricate a coefficient mapping and that's mapping any reasonable function in a zero into an L1 sequence so that then you have this double sum. Now, First remark is this L1 condition means that summation over a lattice, and I'm doing it here for illustration purposes only in the one dimensional case, can be taken to be 
a summation first over n, then over k, or opposite order, or you're saying, well, this is an L1 sequence, therefore only finitely many terms are bigger than some threshold eta, let's say, bigger than one over a thousand. So take those finitely many and sum up all of them, then the error will be small and it will shrink, of course, depending on how many tiny elements you have. But the point is, if you make the threshold small and smaller and say, well, maybe it's not good enough, I take threshold one over 5,000, uh, then I get better and better sums. And that would be a situation where you would say, well, I take finitely many or more or even more. And even if you are taking a, a few small coefficients, they would not destroy the convergence. So these partial sums would be here. So it's unconditional convergence following from absolute convergence. So let's see how we can do this situation. Also, uh, we have to distinguish, maybe I should also mention this, between the index set, these are pairs, integer numbers, kind of this is counting what is the number of the lattice points and the actual lattice points are of course labeled with, uh, in this case, with a standard lattice with multiples of A in the horizontal direction and multiples of B in the vertical direction. And actually that's quite simple. Uh, so I have shown you the pictures. The trapezoidal function is, is, is like the one we have seen that is cutting out in the, in the Shannon sampling theorem, or you can take a small one, whatever. Uh, but the point is it is it has to be compactly supported, so it finishes some point, and it should reproduce some small interval. Now, of course, when we reproduce, uh, re uh, combine this, get the GABA expansion, we try to stay with the BUPU, which is kind of radius gamma, less than gamma. So we decompose it in little pieces so that every point, the psi, psi k is moved along a lattice. The lattice is fine enough, so kind of you're jumping from points, but each of those psi k's should be supported on a ball of radius gamma around the center, which is the AK. So we have exactly this situation here. You are having the trapezoidal function. You move it to the point AK, which is the center of our psi labeled with K, which is of course a shifted version of original psi function. Uh, to the by a times k. So this reproducing property is what we will need for the proof. Now we're, we're doing something like in the Shannon sampling theorem or in the proof, we are looking at the atoms. We are saying f times psi k, but now this is on the time side, is reproduced by multiplying it. Well, of course, uh, we have a reproducing the psi k, so we can say f times psi k is f times left hand side of this equation and that's written in this way. But now the idea is, and that's really the picture by which I was starting, if you take now very um, a, a big alpha or I should say a here, a big enough alpha, no, a big enough b, so I should say, we, we are introducing the, the periodization now. So we are doing a very coarse periodization. So take the original image and just say, well, if the plateau function would be too large, how big should I choose my B? And the answer is well, such that one over B is putting these copies far apart from the original copy. So that none of these copies of my little piece would uh, have anything to do with the support of tau. So here you have some condition um, actually, I have forgotten the correction at this place. It should be the support of T of A times K with tau. Should be, uh, I'm, uh, this should be non-zero, but something like this. So it, you should ex cut out exactly this part. Now to continue, the point is now, uh, so what we really want to do is we want to go from a continuous superposition to a discrete one. We don't want to use full transform, but for a series expansion. And therefore, what we are, have been doing is we take the little part and periodize it in a very coarse manner so that we get a free expansion. 
Now, uh, the important uh, statement that we had already before was that the Fourier coefficients of these periodic functions are exactly the samples of the original function, which is f hat now at the lattice uh, with b times n. So you are getting the coefficients. Maybe I should describe this in a little bit better way. So this is a periodic function, which is a Fourier series expansion. The Fourier coefficients are the samples of our little piece and we can control it by the FL1 norm. That, that's kind of the main message that we have here. Now, what does it mean to have a Fourier coefficient, a Fourier representation? It means that this guy here, but in its periodic ways, it's one over B periodic way, very coarsely periodized, has Fourier coefficients. And again, uh, the coefficients, the total L1 norm of these coefficients is controlled by something which only depends on our parameters. So of course, if you change your A to B and say, well, for each atom, I use a different A, a different B, then you're in bad luck. But I say, well, you have chosen your A or B that gives some constant depending on the size of all these things. And therefore you can control for each piece independent of what the K is, of course, what the coefficients are. Okay, now, uh, when we multiply everything with this uh, tau uh, with the with the shifted version of our our trapezoidal function, what are we getting here? We are getting a pure frequency here, multiplied with a shifted version of this. So the chi b n, the pure frequency with parameter label b n, is turning into a multiplication operator, which is imposed on this but this is the coefficients. And the original formula tells us if we do this multiplication with this plateau function, with this shifted plateau function, then I will get F back. So we have this representation. And of course, the sum uh, of these coefficients, maybe we should recall this, is for fixed K, we are summing over all the frequencies which are required to represent this little piece. but the sum is absolutely convergent. So if you're summing over the K, then you're having a norm expression for a zero. So I should maybe add this to the, to the explanation that this double sum of the coefficients is controlled by C1 times a fixed norm related to the particular choice of the bupu, but we know any, any two bupus are fine. Well, the zero norm coming from the bupu uh, that was used and that was just uh, adapted to be um, suitable for our experience partial. So I go back to the uh, original statement and I want to read it once more to you uh, with the background of how things are chosen. It's saying that if you would like to do a GABA expansion and the GABA expansion is by definition a discrete representation of a function, which is obtained by building blocks, you can call them GABOR atoms, which are obtained from a single function by shift, time frequency shifts along a lattice. Here we have the situation that we choose a regular lattice, which means you have A times integers in the time direction and the B times integers in the frequency direction. In multi-dimension, of course, you can choose any lattice. So maybe you take a, a image processing case, then um, the shift parameters can be from a hexagonal lattice in the time domain, and this can be another hexagonal lattice in the frequency domain. That's actually an interesting problem. And uh, then you would still talk about a separable case, but you can also think of an, a generic four dimensional lattice, and then you choose lambdas and you would say pi lambda of tau. Now I call such a representation as we have it here, a fraser yavard decomposition or atomic representation, because it just says, well, we have a little bit of freedom. I mean, you have the freedom to choose the tau. Um, once I have the information about your choice of tau, how big the support is and so on, I would recommend to use A and B, probably much smaller than it's actually necessary. 
but you would be free to choose A and B. And then with my uh, constructive realization, I would be able to tell you how to choose these coefficients, but it's uh, a very special case. So what if this function is not having plateaus and so on? I have not uh, yet typed uh, the details of the full story and that's part of the story is a rich body of Gabor expansion, which I will not uh, do in detail in this note, but Benish Gabor was suggesting to take the integer lattice, so A equals B equals one, and try to write every function, which every L2 function probably as a convergent series of this form. Well, he didn't even talk about conversions and he was just saying every function should be have, should have a representation where tau should be the Gauss function. Now, only in the 90s, it was verified that with the help of complex analysis that this is a true statement, but all, all, I mean, kind of before it was clear, Gabor's uh, statement is not valid in the mathematical sense. So we can approximate any function in L2 by finite sums of this thing here with the Gaussian and integer lattice, but you cannot represent it. And the, there's a big difference because approximation means that you can choose a new set of coefficients each time you want to have a better approximation, but they might explode. So these coefficients for a given epsilon approximation will have bigger and bigger L2 norms and so you cannot have a perfect representation, not even in a distributional sense. On the other hand, uh, we would here in this situation, we are saying, well, if you're willing to give us some tau, then we are allowing you to do this and you have a representation of this. But what if your function f is not in a zero? What if it's just in L2? Now, I would like to mention that one can take the construction as it is now and find that for functions which are square integrable, you can uh, take the same expansion. You use the Parseval relationship with Fourier coefficients for uh, local L2 functions being in little L2. And then you would find out that you get uh, these coefficients in L2. Um, you could even ask, well, and if I take a sigma, which is a mild distribution, then I would tell you, yes, you can get it, but the coefficients would be just bounded and convergence would be in the weak star sense. But we will see in a, in a while that we can do much better. So the main question is, well, uh, we have done uh, a localization first to get the coefficients with the help of a bupu. So there was some function psi and that function psi was helping us to get the coefficients. And for the synthesis, we're using the function tau. So it's a fairly asymmetric part. Uh, and uh, so what I would like to address next is uh, the question of uh, doing it in a more symmetric way. Now, uh, maybe before doing this, um, I would like to tell you uh, <clears throat> something about Bessel sequences in Hilbert spaces, but in a very concrete setting. So uh, can we hope that, for example, that by being smart, we take the analysis function psi, which was creating the bupu, and the synthesis function tau uh, to be the same. So that would be searching for a tight frame. And I would like to tell you, yes, we can do it, but um, we need a little bit of terminology. So the first thing is, well, a weight, and we have seen it in the finite dimensional Gabor setting. So the, the MATLAB demonstration was, was doing like this. We found out that we can just compute some kind of dual window. And uh, then we would sample the dual window on the same lattice in order to get the right coefficients. So, um, if somebody is saying, well, I found a function G, which is a dual window to some, to your favorite window, uh, we would then maybe have to take the samples of the short-term free transform as a VGF. And we know already uh, that this is an L2 function, but it's also a continuous function. Remember VGF at a point set can be viewed as a scalar product between the 
function or a signal that we want to analyze and the descent window G. So even if F is in sigma in, uh, in S uh, zero prime, if F is a mild distribution, you can choose any G which is in S zero, any good function, and because the pi set G, so the time frequency shifts depend continuously on the parameter set in the space as um, as a zero in the zero norm that's very sensitive it's a strong statement we know that this is giving you a continuous function and it will create infinity if you start with an l2 function but unfortunately it's not true that you can get a guarantee that the samples are also well defined so what can you say about samples of a function vgf which is in l2 of two variables and also in c0 you can of course say that if you sample, this is a sequence which is clearly bounded, but it's also decaying for large values of n and k. But can you say more? And the answer is no, unfortunately not. This is if you're saying, oh, I'm so happy in Gabor analysis, we have no admissibility condition. You don't need an admissibility condition because uh, this square integrability of VGF is always a valid, but now we have a kind of a different admissibility condition. We have to assume that the family uh, of sh time frequency shifted version, so T alpha N modulating by BK, that this is a so-called Bessel family. Now, uh, what does it mean? In our concrete setting, it means that VGF should be in little L2, so it should be square summable for any f in L2, and of course, in the sense that you can estimate the L2 norm of those sums um, by the some constant depending on my a and b, so on the lattice, uh, times the L2 norm of the input function. So uh, to have such an estimate is the, called the Bessel property of the Gaber family, which is the family coming here. So just to establish the terminology, let me recall it, we'll use it later on. If you have an indexed family in a Hilbert space, uh, and that's uh, in the most concrete setting, what if the Hilbert space is Rn? Then I would say, well, somebody is giving you, uh, or maybe we say Rm, and I will, what is a indexed family? I mean, it's just a matrix. Uh, so if you are saying uh, your Hilbert space is R3 and somebody is giving you a three by five matrix, somebody just gives you five column vectors, each of them is in R3. What is the difference between a set and the index family? Well, of course you can have a matrix which have identically columns. So you will say column number one equals column number four but that doesn't matter. It still has a label which makes them different. So you really have an indexed family. That's the main point. It allows repetitions and so on. And it's called a Bessel family. If the mapping that assigns the collection of scalar products in this Hilbert space sense is a bounded linear mapping into L2. Now, uh, uh, just as a simple references, if you try to avoid infinite expressions, then you could say, even if it's an uncountable set, but normally people take countable index, index sets, uh, it's abstractly, you could define it as being a Bessel family. If you are having a constant C, uh, it's not written here, there's a constant C positive, such that for any finite set, you have this control. So of course, uh, if you have a countable set that if this is true, then you can take the full index set or so, but this is expressed with finite terms. So these finite sums are clearly. Now, uh, the good story that uh, I want to mention at the moment and uh, uh, without uh, proving it at the moment is that if you take a decent window and every applied person would not like to use a sync window or a boxcar function because we know they know that uh, it's not a good guy, but you can take any GC function in the zero, then this family pi lambda g for any lattice in the time frequency plane. So in particular, a set d cross b set d allows you to estimate this thing. 
So I kind of, this is a, a corresponding statement to the situation where you're starting from S0 and you take your F in S0 and you get coefficients which are in, S, in a little L1. So it's extending the statement to the statement that L2 functions give you square summable coefficients. And later on, we will use the banach gelfand triple and even S0 prime. So mild distributions have such coefficients and you can sample them and you will get bounded functions and everything is quite compatible. Okay, now uh, let me go to the, in the direction of this improved version of the, of the uh, GABR expansion. We would, uh, and again, it's not that I'm asking the question for a given window, what are the optimal lattices or so, but uh, the question is rather, can I find these functions in a way such that my analysis and synthesis GABR atom are the same? So that, that's uh, the harmless question, which I will answer also with an, one extra trick added to what we have already seen. So uh, the, the choice that we will do is, so I will claim that the, fem, the function phi, which I'm producing here, would be uh, appropriate uh, by, by taking a, a partition of unity and then uh, choose elements yeah, what I, what I need is more or less a function phi, which has the property that the square of this function is a partition of unity or so. Okay, now uh, the, the story that I'm trying to explain is, assume you have already a function phi, which is a partition of unity. So any of our B-spline would be okay. So this ordinary phi is a partition of unity. And I do it now the case for a lambda being just the integer lattice for, for this argument. Then I would say, uh, I hope I have it here. Yeah, we take the sum of the squares, which if you don't take the squares, but the original one, you get constant one. But now the sum, and since all the elements are at most one, it's clear that the sum of the squares must be below one because numbers between zero and one are diminished by squaring it. But unfortunately, this function is now periodic with the same period, of course, as I'm doing my shift parameter, but it's period, a periodic function. And now what, what we need is we should take that function uh, and uh, modify it. Uh, yeah, let me see, I'm a bit lost with this pages. Yeah, I have to, here, here I can do it. So I'm taking this function, that's the one which I was showing you. And I tried to fabricate now um, a function which is compensating this up and down of my function capital phi, that's the sum, the blue one. And what I do is I divide it by the squared of this here. And then uh, I will have to write out details. And then this is a function where, uh, okay, there's a big typo that we have not tk uh, phi, but tk phi hat uh, will be, um, phi squared will be constant one and so on. So, uh, claim that we are getting from this statement is the following. There exists, you can, we can construct such functions again with the situation that if we are choosing A and B small enough, then we can guarantee that the corresponding family is what is called a tight Gabor frame. The tight Gabor frame is something that looks very much like an orthogonal expansion. So you'll see here, it's a kind of phi, family phi indexed with some lattice points. So it's a phi lambda and the sum of the scalar product. So which means coefficients are taken as if it was an autonomous system with the billing blocks or being the phi lambdas that this is representing F. Well, there is a normalization because you can choose a different A, maybe increase the density, then you have to normalize it appropriately. 
So essentially, uh, one way to view this is to say, oh, he's just taking a Riemannian sum for the continuous inversion formula. We have seen there's an inversion formula and that's actually one of the possible reasons why we can do it. But, um, and I added this theorem just uh, today in the preparation of this, this lecture. So that's why I didn't provide now the details of the argument, but it's quite clear. What are you getting um, from these coefficients? You're getting a trigonometric polynomial. What does it represent? It represents essentially f times phi k now because I have replaced psi by phi. But then we are doing uh, the multiplication with the pure frequencies, we are reproducing it. But then just out of the desire of getting something symmetric, I'm imposing not a trapezoidal function which just cuts out the part, but I'm doing a kind of cut out plus uh, a resummation. Therefore we are, we are uh, we have to have this pairing or so. So uh, I have to check the details. Maybe I'm uh, slightly optimistic that maybe I've overlooked some, some detail or so, but definitely it's true that there are such tight Gabor frames and uh, they, they can be obtained in a symmetric way from the original one. Now, uh, there's one operation that we have been doing here and this operation is the division by the square root of this periodic version of this. And that's uh, only justified. I mean, we would not destroy our zero property, of course. And therefore I have to recall to you that we have the Wiener inversion theorem or the Wiener Levy theorem, which says that you can operate on the Fourier coefficients or on the Fourier transform at least locally, but in the case of Fourier coefficients, it's, um, yeah, you can, oh, sorry, on the, on the, in the case of periodic functions, it's just on the function itself, as long as you have a function which is analytic on the uh, range of your function. So what we have to look at is, we have to look at this periodic function, capital phi, which is obtained by the periodization of the phi squared. So remember, phi itself was a bupu and you square it and it's getting smaller. Now, can such a function have a zero? No, because if you would have a zero of this function, you would have a position where all the contributions, all these translates would be zero. But then of course, even if you don't take the square, the, at this uh, kind of at, on the set of the form alpha plus set D, you would have only zeros. And if you don't take the square, you still would have no zero. So it cannot, could not be a bupu. So if we have a bupu with, with let's say continuous contributions, then uh, this will be really a function away from zero. Now, if you take, we take the square root and the inverse, if you take the, the function set divided by one over square root of set, or in other cases we need set goes to one over set, then you would know that it is definitely um, uh, analytic on some interval, which is in our case, we even have the ranges between, I don't know, one or one half to two. So it's a part of the real line. So on that part, it's no problem to do it. So the point is the function capital phi is a periodic function. And what we also know is because we were starting with a good function psi or other ordinary phi, sorry, in a zero, that this periodic version has uh, L1 for a coefficients. Now, this is the importance of the Wiener Levy theorem. But if you go to this here, then this function, so the one over square root of capital phi, also is a periodic function, of course, free of zeros but it also has L1 coefficients. Now, what does it mean it has L1 coefficients? It's a sum of pure frequencies with certain coefficients. We don't care about the coefficients, but we say, oh yes, this uh, original ordinary phi has to be multiplied with certain frequencies. Then we're taking a nicely convergent sum and that will give us the, the candidate phi that we need. So please remind there's a square, it should be a square here. And so in this case, we are happy uh, to have such a property or so. 
Now, uh, again, uh, the frame property um, can be obtained, or the tight frame property can be obtained from any Gabor atom. So maybe I, I tell you uh, two things just without uh, providing details. First is that if you would like to say, well, my favorite function is not creating a nice poop or by, by squares, can I still take it? And then the answer is, well, yes, if you are giving me any function in a zero, these are the good candidates, classical summability kernels, for example, or just your triangular function, your sink square function, anything of that kind of type, or piecewise linear functions on the real line. Uh, can I use it? And then the answer is yes, it, it will be a Gabor frame for sufficiently small A and B as we had it before, but the price to be paid is uh, to to have uh, for I, to choose whether your phi should be the analysis window or the synthesis window. So in the analysis part, your question would be, okay, I have computed now the short-term Fourier transform over such a fine lattice. Please, can you help me to reconstruct? And my answer would be yes. You put instead of phi the phi tilde, which is the inverse frame operator. Um, and uh, that allows you to do the synthesis with the dual atom. Now, the other thing, that, <clears throat> which was our original motivation with Charlie Grechenik, what if I want to have an atomic decomposition? So I'm asking, how can I get coefficients in a linear way? And the answer was, well, you will have to put the dual window here. Now I have this situation with the making things orthogonal, Graham Schmidt is saying one is given and the other has to adapt. So the best way is to, the, to use the symmetric orthogonalization according to the Löwdin or uh, method. And now here, what we have is really that we would say we take the, we take the um, symmetric version of the pseudo inverse of the frame of, or the, of the inverse of the frame operator and that's s to the minus one half. So I will show this with, a, with some MATLAB experiments in more detail, but if you would say, it's more important for me not to use the given function phi and make an asymmetric complementary partner, but I would like to have this as a shape, but I'm willing to modify it a little bit and then do this. And then the answer again is, well, take the frame operator, which I have to discuss. It will be invertible. It's a positive invertible operator. And therefore, square root of the inverse is well defined. And then uh, I can take this and modify both the phi of analysis and synthesis to get some, something here. Now, if you're willing to choose a very small a and b, then the modification of the phi as a function of a and b necessary to have this symmetric representation will be also minor. And this s to minus one half trick is actually optimal in the sense that the deviation from the original choice that you were giving me to the one that you get from this recipe is minimal. So among all those things, there are many functions phi doing for a given lattice and tight frame expansion, I would get the one which is closest to the function here. Of course, uh, what you also can easily explain with such a formula is that you have uh, a non-unique representation. That's the consequence of Boolean law. You cannot have a re spaces. If you really want to expand every function in S zero or even then in L2, then you have to allow some redundancy, which means somebody can steal some of the coefficients you might still be able to recover or might not allow to use some of the atoms, a few of them, um, even infinitely many if they are far apart, uh, then uh, you can still reconstruct and in a stable way and um, compensate this loss uh, in, the, in some way. Okay, um, I think it's a good point to stop here and to, to promise that we will discuss uh, Gabor analysis uh, issues in more detail next week then. Thank you for your attention.